um, a Franciscan uh, tertiary, basically that's just a fancy word to say, third order Franciscan, um, arm of a primitive rule, which is the 1221 rule of St. Francis to the tertiaries. And currently I'm the only one in habit that lives in England. And so by the inspiration of God, we hope that more come to the order. And I'll be interviewing Brother Cassian, and it's great to see you, Brother Cassian. How are you doing? Great to be here. Thank you, Joseph. Mary? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. And you? I'm doing well. It's been a bit of a hectic morning with children and whatnot. The wife has had to take them to school rather than myself today. So I'm uh, well, blessed. I'll get a day off from it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to give us an introduction of yourself and basically what order you're a part of and so on and so forth? Yeah, so uh, I'm Brother Cassian and I'm part of uh, a dispersed Celtic order, a new monastic order called the Community of Aden and Hilda. Okay, and so, so where did you get the brother, the, the name Brother Cassian from? Um, so, uh, so our order is a Celtic inspired order, so we follow uh, what we can glean from historic Celtic Christianity from the mm -hmm. Irish and, and the influence into the Anglo-Saxon and the Welsh uh, Christianity um, and a, a great deal of the influence of historic Celtic Christianity came from the Eastern Orthodox Church as it's become known now and the desert monasticism particularly uh, so one of the distinctive differences between uh, what we've come to term today as Celtic Christianity and the Western Latin Church, uh, which was the mainland continental church, um, is that, that all of Celtic Christianity was monastic based. And they got that influence from the desert monastic tradition. And that came to Europe through two particular sources. One was Martin of Tours, um, who brought it with a particularly Western idea. So he planted his monastic centre in Tours, but inside the Bishop's Palace in Tours. Um, and uh, John Cassian, who probably wrote the most prolific works on desert monasticism. Um, and he also planted his uh, monastic centre in France, Tours is in France. Uh, John Cassian planted his in Marseille's. Um, and he was arguably the heaviest single influence on Celtic monasticism uh, through his works, the institutes and the conferences. Uh, so I took on the name Brother Cassian as that uh, influence. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so you've mentioned that it's, is the order called Gordon Hayden? Uh, yeah, Community of Hayden and Hilda. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so where, where did that name come from in itself? Um, so the, the, the names of the two people, a bit like your, your, your own, kind of uh, with the Franciscans named after St. Francis, uh, Aidan and Hilda were two significantly influential uh, saints in the Anglo-Saxon branch of Celtic Christianity. So okay. Aidan uh, was an Irishman who came and planted a monastic centre on Lindisfarne. Uh, so he was the first person to inhabit and have a monastic centre in Lindisfarne in Northumberland. Um, and Hilda was a contemporary of his who started off as a princess in the East Anglian kingdom uh, and uh, ended up as a, a, an abbess of the double monastery in Whitby and hosted the Synod of Whitby, quite a famous uh, old synod between the, uh, uh, the Celtic and the, the Latin church. Uh, okay. So we took those names um, because Adrian was known as the apostle to the English uh, Hilda was his contemporary. We wanted a male and a female to show a, that there was a better balance of that in Celtic Christianity. Um, and their relationship as well was kind of signified by this Anamkara, as it's called in the Irish, the soul friendship. Okay, perfect. So are you Protestant, Catholic? Some, would you call yourself something else? Uh, well, as, a, as an order, we are completely ecumenical. Okay. So we have Protestants in, of, of every stream, uh, Catholics, uh, Orthodox, um, and, and people who actually identify with no particular denomination as well. So as an order, we are completely ecumenical. Um, okay. And so we don't follow one particular theology. We are open and welcome to, to everybody. Myself, personally, um, I've had a, a very mixed background. Um, okay. All of it has been uh, Protestant, Western Protestant, okay. um, although... 
uh, and various different streams. Um, although at the moment, uh, I, I, with with my current kind of trajectory and, and learning, I would say that I my theology leans more towards the the Eastern Orthodox understanding mm -hmm. than than much Western. I, I had a sense of that. You, just looking at you, you look Orthodox in nature. <laughs> um, but no, I think everyone goes along the Orthodox way for a little bit. Um, especially towards the Jesus prayer that's normally the entry mm -hmm. with that uh, it's one of my favorite prayers anyway um could you tell me about who founded the order was it yourself was it somebody else and how did that really come together like what was the inspiration behind find, founding it was it one day you read a book on some, a monastic and then thought you know what this is wonderful uh maybe you could just share a bit about that yeah, uh, the, the community was actually founded, the order was actually founded uh, by a small group of people headed up by uh, Reverend Ray Simpson. Uh, so this was about 27 years ago now. I've been a member of the order for 17 years, so uh, it'd been going for about 10 years before I uh, encountered it. So Ray Simpson and one or two others who included um, Michael Mitten and Russ Parker, who have written a number of books, both of them on Celtic Christianity and various other uh, parts of Christian life, um, felt drawn into something monastic, um, but not necessarily one of the traditional orders like, like yourself, um, mm -hmm. but created what was then, you know, 20 odd, maybe 30 years ago, a very, very embryonic concept of what uh, has become new monasticism. Uh, so new monasticism really is a, a, has become a, almost like a movement uh, of lay people who feel that uh, uh, the, the way of a monastic lifestyle, like yourself, is a tertiary, is a third order, um, has a great deal of benefit for our everyday life, but not feeling called to a traditional first order or a, a traditional third order or oblate. Um, and so a lot of new monastic communities will create a rule based on some other aspect or, or another. So uh, that's where Ray uh, and the others felt drawn into the, the ancient and historic Celtic style of living out the Christian faith. So they created their rule uh, based on uh, the, the, the Celtic rules that we know and, and have an idea of from places like Iona and, and, and Wales uh, and uh, Lindisfarne and, and other places in Ireland like Glendalough and, and Clonmacnoise and places like that. Um, so they were inspired by the Celtic saints, basically, in the Celtic monastic way. Yeah. So they created this order uh, based on that Celtic way. And it's completely dispersed as an order, like the, the tertiaries uh, branches of the orders. So we don't have a monastic centre. We all live in our own homes, in our own communities, uh, and expected to be self-sufficient and, and living out our rule as part of that. Okay. I think that's a perfect segue, actually. The next question um you mentioned the rule was brought together um could you tell me a bit about the rule um yeah so we do have a rule um we have uh, the three basic monastic principles although we have adjusted a couple of them slightly so the three basic monastic principles are uh, poverty chastity and obedience okay um so those are the the kind of the three main uh foundational aspects of a monastic rule but because we're not residential uh taking a vow of poverty would be very difficult when mm. like yourself you know you've got to keep a house running you've got to you know make a lot of people having families to be to be part of their 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 lifestyle so um we we adjusted it slightly uh from poverty to simplicity so okay, we have that's, a, we, that's we live, that's, yeah. live by a rule of simplicity. Yeah, I know a number of, of tertiary Franciscans. Uh, so yeah, the idea of simplicity is is uh, really what's there. So it's kind of a, a counter of uh, the, the the consumerist greed of, of modern yeah. lifestyle. Um, and then both to reflect uh, a, a, can, a dispersed modern community and also to better reflect Celtic Christianity mm -hmm. historically, we changed chastity to purity. Okay. Uh, because both historically and in our own order uh, in Celtic Christianity, monks were allowed to be married and have children. Mm -hmm. Even the first order ones who lived in the monastic centres mm -hmm. historically were allowed to be married and have children. So we changed chastity to purity. Mm -hmm. So that it's a dedication that all of our physical self, including our sexuality and our relationships, is dedicated mm -hmm. to God. And we kept obedience because, of course, that's about obedience to the rule and yeah. obedience to God. Um, so we kept those. So we have those three 
basic ones. And then we have uh, probably a bit like yourself, we have uh, a number of other kind of bullet points or titles. So we have 10 mm -hmm. other titles as part of our rule. Um, and then every member, because we're a dispersed community, because we have a similar situation to, you know, people have very various different jobs, various different family mm -hmm. lifestyles, cultural lifestyles. Uh, so we allow people to um, create the, the way that that is lived out to reflect their own character and their mm -hmm. own lifestyle as well. So the idea is you take these 10 titles, the 10 bullet points uh, or 10 elements, as we call them, of the, our, our way of life, our rule. Um, and, and then you, you create something that is a life giving reflection based on that rule uh, to, to, to your own life. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe you could tell me about the habit and how it helps with the daily life. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll go into it, uh, through, um, explaining how, how the, the formation of the, the order, uh, is works, how the, how the connection with the, the community works. Okay. Um, so we have uh, different levels of connectivity with the community, with the order. So um, the, the lowest kind of uh, easiest level is called a friend of the community, which is basically you just you just get the quarterly magazine. There's no expectation of you to, to have any connection with the rule or to, to live by it, uh, have any kind of way of life based on what we do. Um, you're just a basic, you're just interested in it. You, you basically just get the, the magazine and, and have a connection here and there. Uh, but if you wanted to actually become a part of the community, we have uh, like a posture on the Visiate kind of stage. Called, we call that the Explorer okay. stage. So you're exploring whether this is the community for you. So, uh, you know, because there's lots of communities out there. There's lots of traditional ones like your own. There's lots of new monastic yeah. communities. Um, and you may have come across our community by, uh, you know, reading a book by one of our members or you've been to um, somewhere where, where we've, we've kind of been doing something, a Christian mm -hmm. conference or something. We do things at various Christian conferences. We do have some houses up on Linda's farm that you can go and stay in on, on pilgrimage and, and personal retreat, mm -hmm. not for um, uh, holiday making, but on, on kind yeah. of personal quiet prayer retreats and things. Um, so you may have come across the community in some way and feel, I want to be part of this community. Mm -hmm. So you're an explorer. The expectation is for maybe a year or maybe two years, if you're not quite sure. Um, but you use that time, you gain a soul friend, which is kind of a little bit like a spiritual director, but something a bit more holistic. Um, and you use that time to work out whether this is the, the calling for you over that year or so. Um, and if you feel it is for you, you then take vows into the community. Uh, and we call that stage becoming a voyager. So you take your first voyager vows mm -hmm. uh, into the community. So you, you do that. And then uh, that's, that's um, uh, kind of the first step into uh, being a vowed member of the community. Now, as part of that Voyager commitment, there are different ways of expressing that. So we've tried to kind of uh, categorize a few different ways that specific people might want to express that. Um, so one of those ways is called a monastic Voyager. So once you've been a vowed member for three years uh, and you feel this is really for you and you're really deeply committed to the community, um, if you feel um, more drawn to something a bit more traditionally monastic, then you can become a monastic voyager. So you've already been a part of this journey yeah. for a number of years. So, uh, you know, you've been an explorer for a year. You've then been a vowed voyager for three years. Um, then you can say, I want to become a monastic voyager. And we actually have a, um, a novitiate year for the monastic voyagers too. Okay. So uh, within that, that novitiate year, uh, there's a, a slightly stricter, um, expectation on living out the rule and living out a monastic lifestyle. So it's actually just the monastic voyagers that are asked to do things like the specification for the fasting, the expectation of greater pr number of prayer hours, that sort of thing. That comes under the, the monastic voyager vows. So you're a novitiate for that for another year. Okay. So this has taken up some time. You know, we, 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 you've got to mean what you're doing. It's got to be a, yeah. a well thought out process. It's a contemplative community as well. So we're not doing anything fast and speedy. There's no fast track way of doing this. Yeah. So you've been an explorer for a year. You've been a, a voyager for three years. You've been a novitiate for a year. So you've already been a part of the community for five years. Um, and then you can become a monastic voyager where it's just a simple ceremony, no more vows, just a ceremony. Uh, and it's at that point that you get presented the habit. Um, okay. So our habit is uh, very simple. We wanted something very simple. 
Uh, we didn't want uh, habits and albs and other bits and pieces collectively. So just, just it's just one very basic, simple habit. We do have a, a leather belt with um, some Celtic knot working embossed on it as part of it as well. Um, so yeah, we wanted something to, to reflect the simplicity both of our community and of Celtic Christianity. Um, we wanted something of an earthy kind of colour. Uh, and of course, Franciscans, you know, they have the monopoly on the brown, so we didn't want to uh, uh, step on any toes or anything. Uh, but also, uh, there's a couple of things within Celtic Christianity that relates to the green. So, of course, one of the things is that green is quite highly uh, related to somewhere like Ireland. Uh, the yeah. colour green is very highly related to that. But also, uh, in Celtic Christianity, there was the idea of three different types of martyrdom. Uh, and each one was named after a colour. So red martyrdom was giving up your physical life to death for the sake of Christ. White martyrdom was giving up your lifestyle for the sake of Christ. So, for example, um, that when, when a lot of the Celtic saints stopped, like Hilda, stopped being a, a princess and became a nun, she yeah. gave up her lifestyle for Christ uh, and someone like Cuthbert did the same as well he, so he was a noble he gave up his lifestyle became a monk and um, so you give up your lifestyle it's a white martyrdom and then there's green martyrdom which is where we take our habit from okay. um, and green martyrdom in in Celtic heritage uh, is when you give up the the pleasures of life to follow a rule of a monastic order so that's the kind of the, the green martyrdom is just is giving up uh, the things that you want out of life for the sake of Christ. So that reflected that as well. So it reflects green martyrdom, which is our commitment yeah. as a monastic voyager. Uh, it reflects something a bit Celtic. It's quite an earthy colour. It's very simple. Uh, so that's that's why we have this habit. So it's only the monastic voyagers that have it. Um, out of the three to 400 members around the world that there is as part of our order, um, there are only 10 of us who have started, mm -hmm. who have taken the monastic voyager step partly because uh, it's a very new step. So I was actually the first person to, to take this step. And I only did that back in 2019, having been part of the community for a good number of years. Um, so it's a very, very new uh, department, if you want a better word, very, very new part of our uh, community, our order. Um, so there's, there's now 10 of us that's, that's taken up that, that step over the last two years. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's that's kind of where where the where the habit comes in, and yeah, we okay. I did it. Uh, so I I I I was part of that uh, creation of the habit and, and uh, okay. decision to wear that. Although it was kind of always a part of the desire of the the founders that the monastic voyages would uh, you know, be more traditionally monastic. So that includes the habit. Yeah. Okay, so just a day to day. Are you allowed to take it off and wear normal clothes to go shopping or? Do you tend to wear it as you go shopping to encourage people to speak to you? Um, do you get those looks, um, that strange looks that people give? Um, just the experience of wearing the habit. Um, mm. If you could tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, again, because we are a, a dispersed order, um, although there is a certain level of expectation that as a monastic voyager, you create your life around the rule rather than expressing the rule around your life. Um, yeah. People will still have, you know, normal jobs and normal lives, etc. So, um, our expression is that that you you uh, the each monastic voyager understands the commitment, the deeper commitment of a monastic voyager, um, and and what the habit means. But it, you wear it whenever you feel it's an appropriate uh, thing to wear. So, personally, myself, um, my decision is that I've decided that it's going to be my default outfit. Uh, and clothing unless there's another reason why um i can't wear it then obviously sometimes there is but generally yeah I, I i go and wander around a supermarket in it and uh and you know walk around town in it and things um so it's just my normal normal outfit normal wear as it would be if i was a first order mm -hmm. monastic yeah so has that helped with somewhat witnessing to others about christ um has it hindered it um what, what's the sense you get from other people yeah I, it, it's a very interesting um experience uh, sometimes so i actually did a lot of research into uh when i was looking at whether we should have a habit as part of this did a lot of research into things like the psychology of clothing um <laughs> and, and, yeah uh, and and that sort of thing and um yeah so i mean 
what the, the the research says about the psychology of clothing is what you wear affects your own psychology yeah. so for example it's proven uh, psychological research that if you wear a suit you're more likely to work more efficiently yeah. uh, so it, it affects what you feel and how you think mm -hmm. so as your own person as you're as i'm walking around in it it affects the way i i am subconsciously as well as cognitively and, and deliberately consciously um, but it also has an effect on other people so how other people view you and approach you makes a difference depending on what you're wearing so one of the bits of research uh, that i did was with an american guy who was a psychologist himself and was doing mm -hmm. si research into psychology of clothing um, and he looked at the difference of uh, the how the people responded to him on the underground on the subway in america um, when he was wearing his suit on the way to work and when he was wearing his running clothes on the way to work mm -hmm. and how significantly different the same people because he was on the same train mm -hmm. each morning so he came across the same people who obviously didn't recognize his face but how they treated him so so with so much more respect when he was wearing mm -hmm. his suit than when he was wearing his running gear although he was behaving no differently so the way that we dress actually subconsciously affects those people around us. And what I've found actually is that, that most people that I've encountered, um, once they kind of go, oh, uh, are you some kind of monk? And you've got past that initial question, uh, feel much more relaxed around you. There seems to be a, a sense of being relaxed. That's what I've found anyway. Um, more so than a number of people I know who wander around in dog collars. That yeah. seems to, to get people quite defensive. So there's something in our uh, Western culture, subconscious psychology that finds monasticism uh, more approachable and relaxing than church, which is yeah. interesting. Um, um, so maybe I'll, that's... I'll to that. Yeah. I completely yeah. agree with it. Um, let me just get the next question. So for the next question, um, I was wondering, like what is different between your orders of monasticism and the conventional monasticism that we see in our culture? Um, actually, being part of uh, um, there's an Anglican uh, group called uh, Anglican Religious Communities, um, and and under the uh, the guidance of uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, they've been coordinating meetings and gatherings with traditional monastic orders third orders and new monastic orders okay. um and one of the the great things that we've been able to see with being part of that just from an anglican perspective um is actually there's there's more blurry lines now uh between these kind of three aspects of of monasticism the traditional the third order and a new monasticism mm -hmm. Um, there's more blurry lines between us now than there ever was before um, and there's a great deal more respect particularly from uh, the traditional orders towards new monasticism um, where uh, there have been some conversations so I, I've been to one of the conferences up at Lambeth Palace as a representative of our, our order um, but there's another uh, one of our, our uh, guardians so instead of having the term abbot or abbess we have the term guardian and um, mm -hmm. we have three guardians um, and one of our guardians, Penny, she's been um, going, she's, she's kind of the main representative for ARC for us. Um, and she's been going along and having some great conversations with first order nuns and monks um, who through this have, have gained a much greater sense of respect for new monasticism and third orders. Um, saying things like, actually, we thought it was almost like you were just kind of playing at being monks and why don't you just join a proper first order but actually you know this is this is come one particular nun has said this to, to penny um actually she found that it was possibly more difficult to be in a third order or a new monastic order because um we're trying to live this out in the real world and yeah. it's easier to to kind of live by a rhythm of prayer when you're in a monastic center and everyone's doing it and the whole center stops but actually trying to do that whilst you're in a job or whilst you're in a life with family and community is quite tricky um there is. <laughs> so yeah um so actually i think there's 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 not so much difference these days particularly with a lot of the monastic centers wanting to do social action and outreach and things mm -hmm. um 
as there was before, uh, where a lot of the traditional monastic orders were very closed away uh, generations ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, because of our, our specific charism, um, people will choose ours in the same way as they might, you know, want to be a Franciscan instead of a Benedictine or instead of an Augustinian or instead of a, you know, Dominican or whatever. Uh, and even if you want to go for the Benedictines, you, you might want to be a Trappist instead of a traditional Benedictine. You know, so there will be particular charisms in each yeah. uh, branch that draws people, that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the differences actually are um, quite important because the more the more uh, diversity there is without division, of course, that's what's really important, having diversity without division. But the more diversity there is, um, the, 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 the wider a, a net you can cast into, you know, who's going to be attracted by this lifestyle. Yeah. Because the basic lifestyle of monasticism is the same wherever you go. But the actual particular charism the more differences there can be, the more diversity there is uh, without division, um, the more people will be attracted, the more resonation we're about to have with them. So, yeah. So I think our, our, our community has its own kind of charism. It's the Celtic flavor, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and that draws people, that resonates with particular people. Well, that's exactly what Christ had taught, is that, that we're all members of one body, yeah. but we all don't have the same job. How, like how many communities within like where are you are you in the united states are you just here in britain or europe as a whole are you in asia um where about on the globe are you um how many of you are there and who can join basically is it just for men is it for women can children join um is there an age limit um uh, just anything like that if there's a limit on who can join um or is it just open to anyone and anyone? Yeah, okay. So um, we started off uh, initially. So Ray uh, is an English uh, vicar or was an English, well, uh, retired now. So he took on the role of, of active guardian 27 years ago from being an, an Anglican priest. Um, however, simultaneously, there was another group who was basically creating the same sort of thing. Uh, and they connected together, uh, Ray and a guy called Jack Stapleton, um, uh, and, and said, we're basically trying to do the same thing. Can we do it together? Uh, and they decided that would be what they wanted to do. So Jack was from America. So okay. simultaneously, the community began in the UK and in the US. Um, okay. So that's still where the majority of our members, like I said, probably about three or four hundred plus uh, maybe a hundred or two in America. Um, okay. So. Um, that's where the main bulk of the, the, the members are, but actually we're completely globally dispersed. Um, so we have uh, quite a large uh, following in uh, Norway and Denmark. There's quite a growing group there. Um, we have a, a, a good growing group in South Africa. We have a number of people in Australia um, and, and most other uh, kind of at least the continents, if not the countries um, you know, around the world, uh, in, in France and, and, and Germany and other places. Um, so we are completely globally dispersed. Um, and each country has their own um, guardians and their own, we call them the CAME Council. CAME is a, an Irish word, uh, which means to encircle and protect. So this CAME Council is kind of the uh, a, a group of um, voted on uh, members. We have 10, 10 of us in our CAME Council. Um, who are uh, the ones who kind of oversee the, the general everyday flowing of the community, the, the, uh, the uh, activities and events that we do. So we have annual na national gatherings, uh, mm -hmm. two or three of those a year. Um, so we kind of make sure those things are organised and, and stick with the ethos of the community. That's the Came Council, I'm part of that. Um, I'm actually the UK Deputy Guardian as well. So we have okay. three guardians and myself as the Deputy of the Guardians. Um, and so each country has its own uh, guardians, it has its own came council, um, but collectively, globally, uh, all the guardians uh, get together um, virtually, obviously, um, 
most of the time we have looked into the possibility of international gatherings but it's so mm -hmm. difficult to do that sort of thing physically particularly you know when the one of the basic principles is simplicity so mm -hmm. to expect an international gathering of people buying airline tickets from australia america britain and europe and africa you know it's quite tricky <laughs> when you're committed to simplicity the so zoom helps quite a lot um, but uh, yeah so we're all over the world uh, okay. and we are open as i said to before we are open to any denomination we are completely ecumenical yeah. um and we are also open to males and females as, as again as i said uh you know, ray started it obviously um i'm a, I'm a male and one of our guardians is penny she's female so open to males and females um and we we aren't closed to children although we don't have any mm -hmm. Uh, as members so obviously some members of the community have children like yourself but perhaps your children are not part of the third order franciscan order that you're part of um so we do have often in our national gatherings we have um facilities for for families to come along so we have people uh, you know teaching the children and doing stuff with the children um mm -hmm. as, the, as the things are happening uh, and we do have a structure for uh children to follow our way of life although we don't have any practically doing that currently okay that's perfect um so what with being an order um and times changing and so on and so forth um for example within the franciscan lifestyle is francis really went for the lepers and the poor and the sick and nowadays we have hospitals here in England and maybe not so much in the other parts of the world, but especially here in England, we have hospitals that take care of that. Mm -hmm. um, we have most of the things that, so like, such as St. Vincent de Paul, we have a, a saint who started something and now it's kind of somewhat, the secular world has taken over and now they, Kind of run those programs to help the poor and so on and so forth so all well, as franciscans we kind of have to look into our everyday thing and see how we can place ourselves within society and fulfill a gap mm -hmm. um so what are your future aspirations and do you see any changes to the order and how you live the lifestyle um do you see any any progress that you hope for in the future um just what are the aspirations for the future really mm. um i think one of the the, the things that, you know you mentioned the i the, the the fact that there's there's less uh kind of you know plagues and and lepers and things yeah. happening in the world today although obviously we are in the midst of a bit yeah. of a global plague if you want better of a term you know uh the, the the global virus uh predicament um but the ba the basics of monasticism really haven't changed since the desert in the second and third century um and so i think that those kind of underlying foundations are are really significant to people we live in a world that is very fluctuating it changes a lot it changes quickly and our actual makeup our psychological makeup often can't deal with that Mm -hmm. So I think some of the, the aspects of monasticism and some of the things that we want to bring into our modern culture is a sense of stability in its foundations. Um, so in the changing flux of life uh, and in the rhythms, which is, again, a, a, a part of Celtic monasticism, the idea of the, the rhythms of, of nature and the rhythms of life and the rhythms of prayer, they all come into that. So the world and the season changes. So uh, one of the books I've written is called The Celtic Year and it has i've written liturgy and prayers and things for uh the eight points of uh the the old british and irish calendar uh which is the four seasonal changes and each season has a midpoint uh the summer and winter's midpoint is the solstices and the autumn and spring midpoint is the equinoxes where nature is turning and the focus is uh, different um, so even in the natural world, the cycles change, the seasons change and things happen. Um, and all, what we learned from, from some of the, the ancient Celtic writings or the ancient uh, writings in, in kind of British and Irish monasticism is that the, the monastic centres uh, took part in the celebrations of these things. So they understood, along with the 
the, the basic uh, foundational security of the monasticism, that life changes. And we need to develop the way we do things. So in the winter, they couldn't do the same things as they did in the summer. And perhaps in our culture, because we don't have as much dependence on the weather as we used to in the pre-industrial age, um, we can look at that and say, well, things change in life. So with yeah. the, the, the basic foundational security of our monasticism, uh, we need to look out into the life that we're living um, and see what there is that we can do. Uh, so we have a little phrase that we use often um, in our community, uh, which is bloom where you're planted, yeah. which is, you know, because we're a dispersed community, God has placed you in the community that you live in. So now bloom with that divine love, with that kind of the, the, the perichoresis, the space to move within mm -hmm. that divine, um, in that space and see where God is leading you. Um, and personally, one of the things I love uh, uh, relating to your order is actually one of the, the, the tenets of Claire, the poor Claire's. So Claire of Assisi uh, had this idea of gaze, consider and contemplate. Uh, so this was you, 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 you gaze. What you do is you go to your local community and just walk around and look and become aware of what is happening, what's going on in the community, what the people are dealing with, what they're struggling with, uh, and then consider what you might be able to input into that to help and then contemplate with God, with that divine presence, how that divine might flow through you uh, into that space. So that, that personally, I think it kind of calculates quite a lot of what we do. Uh, and I think that should be uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis. Yeah. So as a community, each of our members on the feast day of Hilda, uh, which is the 17th of November, we review our way of life, reassess our commitment, look to see if it still uh, uh, fits with our way of living um, and adjust things accordingly. So it's a flexible way of life, although the foundation and security is still there in the rule itself. And so that understanding, that free flowing openness to God, which is actually one of the points of our, our rule, that's one of the things we commit to, an openness to God, um, is a, a balance of that stability with uh, change uh, within okay. it, being able to, to do mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, I can't actually remember what the original question was, but there you go. I hope that's kind of answered. Um, no, that's <laughs> um, and that's precisely it. Within this moving world, our aspiration should be to be stable. Uh, our foundation mm -hmm. is within Christ. Um, the world may change, but Christ doesn't. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And I think that's really where we have to put our roots in as the Bible. Like we need to build on that firm foundation. And so we in ourselves, so we're, we're the branches and we may sway here and there, we're still rooted in Christ. And we always have to bring ourselves back to that. And I think I think I saw something from you um, not too long ago where you mentioned something about the leaves dropping from the trees and then but the trees are still rooted in mm. and that's precisely it we may get a season where we're able to get sustenance from something else from the leaves we might have a little ministry that christ has led us to but it still goes back to that thing christ may mm. cut us off mm. from that ministry he might say right your work here is done and he often does that because he doesn't want us to become stagnant um he doesn't want us to become lukewarm mm. And he just draws us straight back to him, where we might have nothing to do other than stay faithful to him, stay faithful to our basic rule. Within yourself, you've kind of helped build this order up. Um, you're some of its first roots, uh, first to wear the habit and everything. Um, what specifically drawn yourself to join the order? What made you want to live a monastic lifestyle? Um, and, and why? join an order that's being built up from the ground up rather than an order that's already established like the franciscans um so what brought you to your order and so not a different order because like i said it's still in its early years i know i think you said 27 years or so um so it's still fairly new um compared to most like benedictines and other monastic orders um so how did you discern monasticism and what attracted you to it and your story behind that yeah um well my story of coming to this community um is based on a string of accidents that happened through my life 
um, or based on a string of divinely orchestrated structured uh, outworkings of a greater plan, <laughs> whichever one you, you know, think is more likely. Um, but uh, I'll try and be very basic with a couple of bullet points uh, across the journey. So I was born into a family that went to a very conservative evangelical church, didn't like it, decided that I'd reject Christianity by the time I was in my teens, spent most of my teens, particularly my mid to late teens, hanging out with pagans and witches, um, got really into uh, pre-Christian um, kind of uh, Druidic and pagan Celtic spirituality. And that really resonated with me. Um, and then uh, during a, uh, a, a time when in, a, in, my, in my pagan periods, when I was going into a, a, a kind of a higher consciousness state, um, I encountered what I now understand as the cosmic Christ, uh, mm -hmm. who was very different to the historic Jesus that I'd encountered as a child in Sunday school, um, mm -hmm. listening to the stories in this conservative church. Um, changed, well, that changed my trajectory and my spiritual journey. Um, but my christocentric spiritual journey because of that has always been very experiential what i'd understand now is the mystic path um, of our christian faith um, so i never really got on very well with traditional church okay um, i spent uh, about the next uh, 10 to 12 years being a youth worker in traditional churches uh, never really got on very well with much of the theology that i found in it um, okay. protestant and catholic uh, churches that i worked with over the years um, and uh, the only real thing that kept, kept me on the Christian centric journey was the fact that I, I, I had encountered Christ in this vision and I knew beyond knowing that this was the cosmic Christ, that that's yeah. all that kept me there. And then by accident, when I was in a, a Bible bookshop, I worked in the north of England at this time, um, looking for stuff, for resources, for some youth work stuff that I was doing. Um, I came across this book hidden in the back of the bookshop uh, called Exploring Celtic Spirituality. Um, and I thought to myself, well, that's what resonated with me as a pagan in a Druidic uh, pre-Christian era. So I wonder if this Celtic, uh, this, this Christian version of Celtic spirituality would resonate with me as well. So I bought this book. It was the only one in the shop. In those days, you know, these the Christian bookshops didn't have Celtic sections with music and jewellery and books yeah. and prayers and stuff. Um, there was just this one little thing hidden away in the back. I bought the book. Um, and it was by uh, an author, a guy who I'd never heard of before, this guy called Ray Simpson, um, who obviously I've mentioned already today. Yeah. Um, so I read this book and it was one of those moments in, in, in my journey, my life journey that caused me to have a paradigm shift. So first time ever from when I was a child through all the experiences I'd had as a youth worker, um, I read or heard something from a Christian perspective that resonated with me. Okay. Um, now, it, it, it wasn't the easiest book to read, uh, but I loved what I, what I read. I know a number of people that have uh, been affected by it in a similar way to me as well. Quite a lot of people, in fact. Um, so because of this, I thought, obviously, my heart is uh, my, my resonance, my spiritual resonance is this, this Celtic spirituality. So mm -hmm. I just kind of tried to learn more about it, bought more books about the saints uh, and their lives and the Celtic theology um, and tried to live my own life in the same sort of way. And one of the things, of course, as I've already mentioned, is that all of historic Celtic Christianity is monastic based. So I then was trying to create my own way of life, as it were, my own simple rule, which included I was becoming more and more in, in, engrossed in the contemplative tradition as well, uh, founded by the Celtic uh, way of doing things. Uh, but not many of the people, in fact, pretty much none of the people in, in my kind of conservative uh, evangelical circuit that I was still working in as a youth worker really got what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I then had an opportunity to uh, go away somewhere on retreat that was paid for by um, the organization I was working for at the time. Um, so I thought I'd go to one of these Celtic islands and, you know, guess go and shut myself away and absorb the culture, absorb the ancient energy of a place. Um, and so I, I organized to go to um, the, Ion the Isle of Iona, uh, which is one of the oldest kind of Celtic mm -hmm. monastic bases in the UK. Um, so that's what I was doing. Uh, by accident, some of my emails to the Iona community when I was booking a place bounced off Iona and went to Lindisfarne, uh, which is where Aidan based his first centre. Um, so I ended up by accident going to Lindisfarne. 
So I realized very late on in the organizing structure you know, that, 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 that I was booking a place on Lindisfarne. So I decided I'd go there instead of Iona. Um, uh, went to Lindisfarne. Uh, so I found this book by accident. Uh, gone to Lindisfarne by accident. Um, I then uh, walked past, uh, I was staying in one retreat center, walked past a different retreat center that said they had night prayer. They do hours of prayer in, this, in their chapel, in their basement. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll go for this just after dinner. I'll go off and do some meditation on the beach, I'll come back, go to night prayer. So that's what I did. Although I came back too late for night prayer. Um, so the door was locked, but there was a group of people inside uh, that were just kind of chatting and stuff after night prayer. So they invited me in, made me a cup of tea. I sat and talked with them. Uh, they all kind of started to introduce themselves. One of the guys in the room opposite me was Ray Simpson. Uh. Okay. Uh, and so I, I suddenly realized, you know, this was the guy who wrote that book a few years ago that, I'd, yeah. you know, caused this paradigm shift in my own spiritual journey. So uh, I then went and chatted with him the next day in his sitting room, sat by the fire, drinking tea, talking about life, talking about what I was trying to do, talking about the way I was trying to live. Um, and he basically said, what you're doing is pretty much our rule verbatim. You're just trying yeah. to do it on your own. You've just discovered this and, and trying to do it on your own. He gave me the, the community handbook with their rule written out and explained in it. Um, and I read it and went, yes, exactly what I'm doing. So can I join? And he said, no, to start with. Um, but I have to go home and discern that this is the right community for me because there's a lot yeah. of others to choose from. Uh, and if I'm being drawn to some kind of monastic living, uh, in like a new monastic life or a tertiary life, then I have to make sure that now I've realized that that's what I'm being drawn to that actually this is the right community. So this was in the May of that year. Uh, so I spent the next few months to late August that year, um, praying about it, contemplating it, and really discerning what was right. Um, and, but uh, really I thought this, this is a whole set and series of divinely orchestrated accidents. So yeah. I think this is something that I'm being drawn to rather than me being making a choice. I'm not thinking about which order might I like, you know, might I like to be a Franciscan or might I like to be a Benedictine mm -hmm. oblate or might I like this? Actually, this is something that seems to have this divinely orchestrated path that's leading me here. Um, so that's when I joined, uh, joined that August. Mm -hmm. I said that was 17 years ago. This coming August will be 17 years. Yeah. Oh, that's a lovely story. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think we've covered quite a lot today. Um, time's getting on. Um, so it was more about the Forest Church, the last questions, um, but I think we touched quite a bit on mm. the order and how that integrates with Forest Church. Um, so if there's anything you could conclude and maybe give a bit of a basis of a devotion that people could take home, such as like the Jesus Prayer, Rosary, or some sort of meditation within the scriptures like Lexio Divina, um, if you could just share your favorite devotion of how you encounter Christ and maybe the basis of how others can start that at home. Mm. Yeah, um, within our own order, we, we create uh, the liturgy for ourselves. Um, mm. And uh, we, we have that, um, we have a few of our own books um, that we use. We, we take some of the um, traditional, uh, what's thought to be traditional Celtic prayers, some more modern Celtic prayers from um, we, we use some from the Northumbria community, some from David Adam, who's obviously um, you know, a, a modern, uh, modern day Celtic writer. Well, he just died a, a year or so ago. Um, uh, there are so many. One of the things that, that's in Celtic Christianity is very much that every part of life is spiritual. There's no mm -hmm. separation. It's all holistic. There's no sacred and secular. So there's a lot of prayers for everyday activities. Um, um, there is there is a, a, a one particular prayer that I've uh, written. I just I've got it here. I, I tend to use it as my morning devotion. So I start with uh, an hour of uh, meditation. Some some parts with music, some parts with silence, um, and uh, almost every day I use these words uh, for my prayer. So um, we'll uh, end if that's all right with a bit of silence because the contemplative uh, aspects that the, the the sense of being still and being aware and being present is very much 
uh, a part of the importance of, of uh, our order and you know generally I think Christianity is lacking a great deal in that sense of being still and being contemplative and being present um, so just a, a moment of stillness then I'll just read the prayer because it's based as a morning prayer uh, it's a bit like the the Lorica's prayer that you can find sort of like Patrick's breastplate so it starts each phrase starts with I arise so this is the coming into the day um, but uh, we'll, we'll you know arising from anything arising from your seat arising from your rest arising from bed whatever part of day you're in we can do that so let's be still and silent for a moment just breathe gently and then feel that divine presence We become consciously aware of the presence of the Trinity of love expressed as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I arise today in the strength of the almighty divine creator, the paradoxical three in one, the great mystery of the universe and the intimate lover of all things. I arise today to seek out the good works which have been divinely set for me, that I would walk the path unfolding before me for the good of all people and all creation. I arise today in the strength of the one who strengthens me from the core of my inner being to the edge of my existence. I arise today with you by my side and in my heart. Let us live together as one. And may the divine energy which flows through the earth flow through me today, connecting me as one with everything. In the name of the source, the saviour and the sustainer. Amen. Thank you very much for that. Um, Bless you. I believe it took far too much of your time, but I really appreciate it. I think we answered most people's questions. It certainly answered my questions. Um, and that, again, I really appreciate the interview today. Um, I think we covered quite a lot. Great to be with you. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you. Bless you.